Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nathan. I am a brand ambassador and Leica Academy instructor working at Leica Store Bellevue in Bellevue, Washington. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a very special moment for us because this is an opportunity for all of us to discuss what we all love, photography. And today specifically, we're gonna be talking about landscape photography. We're gonna be talking about black and white. We're gonna be talking about range finders and medium format cameras. So please sit back and relax and thanks so much for joining us. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Philip Blair. Philip Blair is a landscape photographer who works primarily in the Midwest and Pacific Northwest. He shoots a lot in black and white with the Leica Monochrome 246 camera, as well as the Leica S system. Philip Blair is also an academy instructor. Philip and I worked on multiple academy workshops here in the Pacific Northwest, including the Monochrome workshop at Deception Pass, as well as a Alpine workshop in the uh, Mount Rainier National Park region. He's also doing a new workshop in 2021 to talk about more about one's artistic vision, as well as focusing on black and white and landscape photography. Philip also had an exhibition at our store, at Like a Store Bellevue, called Solitude So and Nice, which will be a lot of the shots that we'll be talking about today. So once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them down in the QA section. And if you have any comments, please feel free to write them in the chat. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Philip. It's a pleasure. Hey, welcome. How are you doing? Hello, hello. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Indeed. Absolutely. All right. Okay. I heard uh, hello, that you're Nathan. traveling around the United States. How's that going? It's going really well. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm stunned. I'm watching uh, the joiners. We've got people from all over the place. Indeed. Um, this is really, really a neat opportunity to to speak about um, all these private sojourns that I go on to do photography. So yes, I've been out on the road for three weeks, Nevada, Arizona, Northern California, and I'm currently in Eastern Oregon mm. and uh, another week to go. And so uh, it will have been a month uh, by the time I get home, a little bit longer than a month. So- uh, Fantastic. Um, yeah, these are, these are rare and special outings, so yes. So before we get into that, I think it'd be appropriate for us to start at the beginning of your photography journey. So Phil, could you tell us a little bit about how you started with photography and how that beginning influences your work today? Right, okay. So my, uh, my love for photography, I, I can pinpoint that to um, a date in January, 1979, when my dad took me to the Columbia Gorge, which is between Oregon and Washington which is still one of the favorite places that I go to see the solar eclipse of, two, of uh, 1979 that came through the Northwest. Mm. And my dad made pinhole cameras for us to view this. And uh, though I was only in fifth grade, I was, my mind was blown. And I knew that um, seeing fantastical things and using cool gear was gonna be a big part of my life. Now, I didn't say at that moment, I'm going to become a you know a professional landscape photographer because of this. That's not what that's not what happened. It's just it, you know it just it just grew naturally. Every time everywhere I went, I took a camera. Um, I never uh, really took photography terribly seriously until I started uh, about 2000, 2005, 2006 is mm -hmm. when I really started to take to take it seriously, and uh, then when I started first started shooting my first Leica equipment and I was like wait a minute this is really special I can do something really really expressive with this and it's all been a whirlwind ever since mm. so was uh, black and white photography something that you were interested for since the beginning was that something that kind of captured you it's always been attractive to me yeah mm. it's always told a different story than color um and I think I think we can all relate to that but maybe, maybe we all have, most of us have difficulty explaining or articulating what is that special something that is black and white. Uh, for me, it uh, stops time 
in a much more powerful way. It's kind of mm. like it, it stops time for all time. Mm. Whereas color uh, is easy to date because styles change and the looks of cameras change and the looks of artwork changes. It doesn't change so much for black and white. And mm. um, as we get to talking about the autobiographical nature of my work, um, you'll be able to see why why I like black and white so much because it, it it preserves the moment in a much more special way to me. And I think I think some people share that share that perspective as well. There are also some complexities in black and white that are really, really, really special and personal to work with that creates a, when combined with my personal story, really creates a, you know, a perfect moment. Um, mm. Not a perfect moment in life, I mean, in an ideal state, a perfect ideal state, which isn't my common, I mean, you know, we don't live in ideal states all the time, um, but that's what I try to achieve in my photography. So. I think that uh, black and white also allows us to kind of go into the imaginary because we're so consumed by color and how we see the world. And we tend to not focus on the shades of gray and the very dark and the very bright and how that might change the way we look at things. Were you always into landscape photography or did you start with other types of genres of photography when you were using the black and white style? Yeah, I was always attracted to landscape. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I'm not doing anything else, where do I want to be? I want to be outdoors. Um, I want to be driving. I want to be exploring. Um, and, you know, I always come back an improved version of myself is what it feels like. And so uh, I've always been attracted to landscape photography. In the city, uh, I've enjoyed uh, street photography. I've enjoyed uh, documentary and uh, architectural. Mm. but really as a substitute for, for landscape. Um, landscape, you, you know, it's very time intensive. You got to plan ahead. It can take entire days. Whereas street photography is something you can do right now, you know, anywhere, if you live in an, an urban environment. Absolutely. Um, likewise with our, I mean, architectural elements are around us all the time. So, um, you know, like equipment is so fun to, to use, you, you don't really want to put it down. So, I wound up shooting, you know, urban environments too. But landscapes always been my, always been where I, where I found the most special personal place. Yeah. Nice. This was one of your earlier shots, if I'm uh, correct. And could you tell me more about this shot? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really important photograph. I have maybe five or so photographs that are that really tell my personal story from, you know, really deep deep perspective. Um, and I created them that way to, to express how I feel about things. So um, it, I can't talk about my work unless I get really personal because my work is really personal. Um, my work has given me the ability to, to have community. It's given me the ability to speak to other people about personal matters, knowing now that a lot of the things that I used to be really insecure about in life are really universal issues that many people have struggled with. Mm. Um, specifically, I've dealt with some, some clinical mood issues, depression, anger, um, rapid mood swings, insomnia, debilitating insomnia. This photograph is, is I made this to, to illustrate that sensation, that loneliness, mm. that isolation, that sense of separation and you know what's wrong with me and the rest of the world has their act together, they can sleep. You know, why am I awake? You know, I've watched another TV program. I've listened to some music. I've jumped around. I've done jumping jacks. I still can't get to sleep. Mm. And, um, you know, then daylight breaks. I feel defeated. I feel like I lost. <laughs> mm. And I'm facing the day underslept. You know, it, your body is exhausted. Mm. And you can't sleep. And so that's just one example of the one of the irregularities in my life. Um, mm getting more personal, you know, I always thought there was, there was um, something wrong with me as a person. I think, um, you know, I've always been a little awkward socially, always had some kind of obscure interests. Um, my friends used to, would, or not, not my friends, but people at school would tease me about the words that I use, you know, nomenclature, vocabulary, whatever. Um, you know, I think it's, it's easy for us to grow up thinking that there's something uniquely wrong with us. Mm. And, uh, and I feel like that was pretty pronounced in my, in my upbringing, um, you know, and through some, 
you know, important events in my life and in my adulthood, you know, I was, I, I was forced to face these things. And I, there was, it wasn't one particular moment, but over a period of a few years, I realized, you know, I, I am this person. <laughs> I'm not going to be here forever. This is the only person I got. Mm. So screw it. I'm going to be this person. <laughs> And I even developed a sense of humor about it and, and illustrating my feelings and ideas through photography has produced that magic for me. And I didn't expect that out of life. I didn't expect, okay, well, I'm going to take these pictures, these autobiographical pictures and reveal my personal story and produce this fantastic artwork and my life's going to be awesome. Um, that's not what happened. Um, just very gradually, I started to produce pictures that express how I felt. I noticed this and I thought, gee, I can use this. And I produced the picture that you just, that you just had up. Yeah, and, and also it seems like you are the type of person that thinks very, for a long time about a shot, whether it be in the actual composition, but also the editing phase and that you do a lot of testing with your gear before you go out for the final shoot, whether you have some scouting locations or you're testing out gear for dynamic range, I think this was a good example of a test that you sent me as far as shooting with the monochrome 246 camera. It's a black and white only camera. And uh, you were describing how surprised you were, how you were shooting into the sun in the shots, but you were able to retrieve all the data and not only data, but the fact that the plane itself is a dark black paint. And looking into the details, you can see an incredible amount of details. And I'm sure that when you saw this image, this kind of sparked an idea for your landscape photography where landscape photography is known to have this crazy dynamic range that you need to control. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so why don't you go back to the, the dual frame? Yep. Okay, so uh, yeah, I love to experiment with the gear because it's so beautiful and it's so capable. Um, like so many like owners, you, you don't wanna put it down it's, it's a piece of artwork in itself, yet it also produces world-class results. Um, and that, that's just inherently cool. I can't, even, I can't even say how cool that is. Absolutely. So um, in the outdoors, yes, I shoot a lot of wild lighting conditions on purpose, mm -hmm. breaking rules, shooting into the sun, because that's, for me, that's where drama is. And it replicates real life. You know, we don't, just because something's overlit, doesn't mean it's not interesting. A good example would be a traffic light. We've mm. all had that experience at sunset or sunrise where the sun, you're at a traffic light and the sun's right next to the red light. And, and you're, trying to, you're trying to see the light turn to green. You don't know if it's gonna, if it's gonna turn to green if, you don't, if you're not gonna notice it. It turns into a safety thing. The light isn't less interesting because the sun is there. It's actually more interesting. Mm. And the experience is, is really disorienting. So I like to replicate that in some of my photographs. I also like the personal, the, the personal challenge, you know, can I yep. do this? Is this gonna work? So um, this is at Payne Field, not far from where I live, where Paul Allen's Flying Heritage Collection is kept. So this mm -hmm. is a flying version of an F4U uh, Corsair from World War II. It's navy blue, very dark navy blue. It looks black and in, in, uh, even in a color picture. Um, if I was an aircraft photographer, I would use a flash, of course. Mm. Uh, this was on a photographer's day where photographers were invited to, to shoot on the tarmac the day before a big event. And there were no, uh, there were no other uh, general public wasn't there. But yes, if I, was, uh, if I was shooting this as an aircraft photographer, I would use a flash. Um, but what I did was uh, I shot it by hand. Um, I used a dark red filter. And I do this in my landscape photography. I wanted the sun in the shot just to see if I could pull it off. And you can see in the unproduced photograph, go back one, that the, I mean, there is no correct way to expose something like this without a flash. <laughs> um, I like that. I like that challenge. And you can see that the camera produced some halo around the airplane. Mm, indeed, That's okay for me when it comes to an impossible shot. Um, so there's some halo in the resulting image. But stunning to me, yes, is that the sun is in the shot. And if you go to the next one, all that detail is there. Yeah, you can read the name of the engine. Uh, and yeah. you, can, you can see all the bolts going on. And the fact that you could get that with such a dark color to begin with, while completely underexposed due to the sun being in the shot is 
for me, I think that if I took this shot and I was planning to do landscape photography, I get very excited because then I know that I can basically shoot whatever I want. There's just nothing that I can't shoot when I do a test like this. And uh, I think it's really cool that you go out there and you kind of know your gear before you go out to these locations, because the locations might be new in themselves. You might have to figure out all the challenges of the location itself, but you know your gear. And so you kind of have a leg up on whenever you arrive somewhere. Right. With landscape, you don't have a lot of choices. Um, there's no flash <laughs> for, right. for, <laughs> for acreage. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's, um, you know, you can't call the, the, uh, the, um, the weather circumstances. And if you're in an area that you're not familiar with and you're seeing a scene for the first time, you don't know where the sun's exactly going to set. Mm. So yeah, these, you don't have control over these things and to know the limits of your cameras is definitely, definitely key, especially when you're intentionally under exposing like I do. So let's dive right into it. Um, this was shot with the Monochrome 246, if I'm correct. Uh, and I believe yep. a 50 APO. That's 50 APO, yeah. Beautiful. So this is a great example of, of kind of the mindset I look to capture with my photography. So this is, this is not an infrared photo, this is frost. Mm. So that's very heavy frost. It's not freezing fog. We do have an example later in the series about freezing fog. But this is frost uh, with half sunlight. So this state existed for maybe five, five minutes and then the frost right. began to disappear. So this is a good example of the uh, what I call a silver frosting or a mercury frost that that um, the monochrome, especially when you work the luminance channels, the darks especially mm. um, by the half stop in Photoshop. The I mean uh, it, I mean the, the the subtle beauty is like it leaves me speechless even though it's my own work. You know. Yeah. I think that uh, the this camera specifically gives you tones that um, give you a, a realistic impression of exactly what was going on from a luminosity standpoint that other cameras are, are challenged by. And uh, just like looking at this shot, it seems like it's so effortless, effortless that um, you're getting these incredibly white tones in the sky with the fog in the background while still retaining that shadow detail right underneath the trees. Um, and I, I think that the, the, that separation and the ability to see so many shades of gray really helps you. Um, I mean, you don't like the fact that you said that this is not with a filter or with the infrared, you know, camera or anything like that. That's incredibly impressive that you can get a raw file like this and, uh, and work your magic um, to get exactly the tones that you were seeing. I think that this also plays well with the next shot right here. Um, one of the things that you mentioned about kind of not knowing you know, where the sun's going to be, how, what the landscape's going to look like. Do you do any kind of scouting before you go out and shoot? If you, do you plan out maybe the seasons? I'm going to come back in the winter time. It's now the summer. It's too, there's not enough snow or something like that. Yeah. So ideally, um, ideally I would scout the day beforehand mm. and then shoot the next day. If it's a new, new environment for me, but that's not always, that's not always what you can do if maybe you need to be somewhere a couple days down the road and you've only got today to shoot right um in which case it makes it make it a fast affair because the light changes quickly um it might be a different case in the desert southwest where you know a sunny day is common not so much in the northwest where your cloud conditions change quickly the lighting conditions change quickly so ideally yes um i would scout the day before um, even if it's a environment that I'm familiar with, but that, that doesn't always happen. Um, this particular scene here, I, uh, am familiar with the scene. I'd never shot it before. There was, uh, this is a Columbia Gorge, uh, near Lyle, Washington mm -hmm. on the Washington side in the foreground on the far side is, uh, Rowena point on the Oregon side of the river. And so this is about an hour east of, uh, Portland. Mm three feet of snow here, really rare at this part of Columbia Gorge. So it slows everything to a crawl. And it's a big opportunity to get shots that are unique. And this particular morning, um, I didn't know there was gonna be half fog. I didn't know that no, there was gonna be no wind, also very rare in the gorge. So we've got a, the, so the, the river is slowed by dams. And so without any wind, there's still a current, but without any wind, there's a, there's a glass surface, mm. very rare. Um, half light, 
in fog with deep snow. I mean, what a it's a total gift. Um, I could go to this location 20 times in the winter and not and not find something as perfect as this. So um, you can see the light is hitting the, 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 the snow surfaces in the far right on Rowena Point. The sun mm. is just about to pop out. In the next shot, you can see the, the, the sun starting to come out. Um, the, the tree is in, prof is in uh, you know, dark profile. That scene out there above the river is really, really bright. Mm. Um, so you've got snow, which is almost a, a directionless light source. Um, it'll drive your meter crazy. Um, so, but I like the, uh, I like the profile. There's not a lot of detail in those shadows. Any filters so, for the shot? No, not on this one. Wow. One, one of the things I also like about your work is that when you find a scene that you like, um, this was shot with the 50 APO, I believe, uh, yep. you go back to it with a different lens or you, uh, try to explore different perspectives with a different lens of the exact same scene. Can you talk more about that as well? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> for this particular project, the Snow and Ice project in 2017 is unique in that uh, most all of the images I captured over a 10 day period. So an extremely high hit rate, mm. um, probably because I didn't have anything else going on. I had 10 days just kind of emerged in my schedule where I, where I didn't have anything to do. And I was like, all right, well, we have some unique snow, I'm gonna go shoot. I had two cameras and I had two lenses. I had the 240, the 246, the APO 50, and the APO 135. Mm. Um, the APO 50 has had grown to be my favorite lens of all time for the M. In fact, I'd never shot 50 millimeter uh, before I shot the APO 50. I started to find scenes just for that lens, and that's how I adapted to, to 50 millimeter. Right. Um, and then the 135 gives that extra reach. And so I have, when I find really great conditions or something I want to shoot, I want to see how it looks through both lenses. Yeah, um, definitely. So the, tri the tripod is set up. I'm there. I may as well shoot it in 135 too. And Absolutely. The, and it results in pairs of photos, one at mm. 50 and one at 135. Um, not all the photos come out that way, but this, this particular pair did come out really well. And also with the 135, really shows um, some really impressive detail. You can see three cars down there on Interstate 84. Yeah, I have a zoomed that, in version of this shot right here. That's just, you can yeah. see the headlights of the cars. Like, yes, <laughs> that's so yes. far away. <laughs> yes, in fact, uh, if you did some, you know, crazy zoom experiment on this, you can almost read the license plates. Wow. And I'm, and I'm, about, I'm about a half mile away in that shot, so. This is this also was taken a few few minutes later after the fifty, and you can see the glow on the on the surfaces of the snow there. Yeah, so the sun is the sun is to the upper right, and uh, it's spilling out, um, you know, on the on the surfaces of the snow. Really perfect lighting for snow. Uh, again, something that you can't order up like uh, like room service. <laughs> yeah, this is an exquisite image. One of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat a lot is. Do you shoot with a film camera as well? Do you like to shoot digital and film or mostly digital? Um, recently, I've taken to shooting just one camera on my trips. Mm. Um, I do use a Hasselblad X-Pan, which is a rangefinder, nice. double wide cinematic frame. Um, so yeah, I love to do film too. Um, my, my shooting style is mostly adapted to, to digital, but yes, uh, film is a great, education to remain in remain in contact with you know for the duration sure but i it, it's it's a lot more time intensive you know to process to to shoot everything the hit rate can be just as high because you're you know very focused on you know how many shots you have absolutely um but uh for my workflow digitals is so much more uh, efficient for all the reasons that i think we're familiar with and I think specifically for this shot right here, we kind of talked about a little bit in the beginning of our program that you like to go deeper into the images by editing. Can you talk more about this shot? Yeah, so uh, first of all, this is a, a light contrast image. So this also is the Columbia Gorge. That's, or that's Washington in the foreground and Oregon in the, the, the background. 
it's actually a composite. So I wanted a shot of parallel lines on the top with this really beautiful, um, you know, S curves and swirly ice in the foreground. So this Absolutely. is a an inter train track lake. So the bar in the in the middle middle top is a train track. Mm. So the 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 Columbia Gorge is heavily engineered with with train tracks, dams, um, all kinds of stuff. And so there are these inter inter um, track lakes, which is what's in the foreground. And they stock these with fish for the fishermen and stuff. And in the winter, they will freeze because there's no current. Right. So the, the river on the other side of the, the train tracks is is flowing. And then there's the train tracks on the far side uh, on, or, on, on the Oregon side as well. So I wanted the contrasting, you know, the parallel uh, geometrically ordered top third of the photo in combination with the, the swirly formless, less form full, you know, foreground. Um, mm. So I didn't have this perfect scene in one shot. So I actually took the ice from one shot and I took the train from a couple hundred, a couple hundred yards down, down river because nice. that train's not moving um, and the lighting was perfect. So yeah, right. I, comp them, I comp them together. Very easy to do with, uh, with the river and the straight line along the railroad tracks. I don't composite a lot of my images unless I have something really specific in my mind and I really want it. And um, I don't want to hide um, you know, how I came up with the photo. Sure. If all those things, if all those boxes are checked, then I'll do it for sure. Yeah. How much time do you spend per scene when you arrive somewhere do you, do you get it, do you stay there until you get a specific shot that you have in mind or do you set a specific amount of time because the sun is moving and you gotta get, you gotta go somewhere, you gotta go somewhere else? Yeah, for, for this outing that I'm on um, through the desert Southwest and Eastern Oregon and Northern California, the winds have been very high. Mm. So the light changes really rapidly. Mm. So I, I've had to shoot really fast. Um, this particular scene is freezing fog in Eastern Oregon, actually not far from where I am right now. Um, this light remained constant for a couple hours. So this was fog and freezing fog at that. So that's different than frost. Freezing fog, um, you know, will, will, it's kind of like frost times 10 and it's maybe 15 to 20 degrees colder. Mm. Um, these lighting circumstances, these lighting conditions um, lasted for a couple hours. And I also had the time, I didn't need to be anywhere to a hotel or campsite by any you know, particular time. So I was able to take my time with this particular one and, and really sink into the, uh, the quietness of this particular scene. Something else I wanna talk about with this image and the last one. Sure. So lighter contrasts, um, for me, really tell a different story than heavy contrast. Mm. Um, in print, these two are probably some of my favorite prints because the on, on a really heavy gauge cotton paper, the the surface, the the what little black is there, mm. almost takes on an etched appearance, kind of like what you'd see on like uh, currency. Mm. Um, and on a really heavy you know gauge paper, it feels really good. And it, it looks, I mean, it's just so captivating. Um, and it's, uh, it's such a different experience than looking at something with really bold contrast and really bold shapes, really strong subject. I mean, it, it, those, these images are, can be very powerful, uh, but sometimes they're not very complex. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm telling the story of my life and the nuances and you know, the, the variations, um, the, 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 the quieter, cleaner, boring moments that come and go. In my mind, those are lighter contrast experiences. Mm. And these are also more of a challenge process because the temptation is to just hammer the contrast slider, you know, <laughs> shadows right. all the way up, you know. Um, and it's fun, but I think the, the greater, more mature challenge is to, is to develop lighter contrasts that captivate. Yeah, and I think that's a challenge as well with digital cameras is that usually digital cameras have a lot of detail and information in the shadows and have a little bit less detail and information in the highlights. So being able to control those midtones and highlights together to get this shot where you're photographing snow, for example, but you still want that detail in the leaves and the frozen fog in the background there. I think it's also a testament to 
how you are seeing that scene and reproducing exactly what the scene looks like. I think that there's, a, like you said, there's a lot of people that want to make the scene their own, but there's a certain amount of respect that you have for the landscape that's before you that you want to capture the majesty that you're seeing in the first place that um, captured your attention in the first place. So this is a shot, we were talking about the monochrome camera. I believe this is shot with a 240, is that correct? That's right, that's right. Yeah, so uh, what I did on this trip was I had the 135 on the 240 and I had the 50 on the APO. Mm. Uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, 50 on the 246 monochrome. And uh, because the majority of my shots were with the were with 50 millimeter, um, some of the frames were good, or some of the, the, the settings were good enough where I'd take the 135 off the, off the 240 and um, put it on the 246. Uh, other times I would, I would be in such a hurry. This particular scene, the lighting was changing very quickly. So I didn't bother to swap lenses. It was also very windy. I didn't want to get junk into my cameras. Um, and so I just shot 50 with the, mon with the monochrome and 135 with the 240. Uh, the 240, uh, the color or the conversions from color to black and white aren't going to match uh, the, the monochrome. Mm. But it, the 240 and quality glass on the front is still an excellent camera mm. um, and is going to produce very capable, you know, um, black and white conversions. And so having worked the, the monochrome for most of these shots and then having one frame that I really wanted, wanted to produce, I know it's not going to be as good as the monochrome, but I really like the frame, um, puts a challenge on uh, and it actually improvement on whatever workflow you've got for converting some color. Can you talk more about um, how to shoot in cold environments? We, we've been shooting you know, in the mountains. We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing you have a tripod with you. You're, you're, you're very stable. You talked about shooting in the wind. How do you deal with the cold? Um, <laughs> it's not easy. So uh, this particular trip has been very windy and very cold. Um, it's, pretty, it's resulted in some very uncomfortable afternoon shooting. Um, I've actually was shooting with a couple guys in Moab. Um, I think they're probably watching right now. We had some cold days at the Grand Canyon as well, mm. um, where you know, I, I didn't know if we were gonna make it. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you, I mean, uh, common sense, you dress warmly, um, gloves, you know, wind protection, definitely. Um, a sense of adventure, a sense of challenge. Uh, the photo we're going to look at the, at the very at the very end here, the one with the crop and the, the large print, mm. was one uh, where it was so windy, and I was actually also dodging snow plows, mm. where there was no setting up of a tripod. And even if I was setting up a tripod, it's so windy that I I'm in better shape propping the camera on my on the window of my truck, mm. which is what I did. So improvisation. Um, I like that kind of challenge. Yeah. Not all shots are going to come out, but um, the ones that do, I mean, it, it makes it all that all the much more special. The M's um, are not adapted to you know harsh weather. Mm. So what I've done is uh, I've given myself license to the, the 240 and the 246 to just use them to death. Mm. Um, and I mean, they're not collectors; they are shooters. And so a recommendation I'd have for someone is uh, if, if they're a collector and they don't want to, they don't want to uh, mess up their, their pretty Leica, um, that's great. Leave it on the shelf, um, get a used one and shoot the crap out of it. <laughs> and um, you won't be disappointed. Um, it, it might take a, you know, some, an effort to get past the, <laughs> I'm going to damage my camera, but they, these cameras will reward you. <laughs> Yeah, it's designed them. to be shot. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a I middle body. It, right. And, and it's what an M wants to do is be shot. Mm. It doesn't want to sit on the shelf. If M's are talking to each other, you know, oh, I got, you know, I, you know what I mean? I'm being silly, but I get very excited about the subject. Absolutely. One of the things I'm noticing a lot in your work is you are working a lot with a lot of different environmental components like wind snow, fog, things like this. 
in this specific shot, this is a, a 135 millimeter version of the shot that we have right here. And again, we have those elements that you're working with. How do you expose for fog? How do you expose for wind and trying to get all this nice detail in your shots? Yeah, so as a rule, um, I'll underexpose. Okay. Um, just very simply. Uh, in post, the, the highlights are your first casualty always. Whereas uh, if you underexpose, you, your chances of recovering detail out of the shadows is much better. Mm. Some, some would say, well, that's a sloppy way to shoot or that's a careless way to shoot or you're going to get noise in your recovered shadows. My answer to that is, okay, well, if I use absolutely perfect and proper technique or I avoided noise in all cases and recovered shadows, then I wouldn't have a shot. Mm. That's do an easy ever, equation for me to answer. <laughs> do you ever look at the histogram on the back of your camera when you're shooting just to make sure that you are within the bounds of what you want in the exposure? Um, not often, actually. Mm. Um, I've had some say recently, you know, if you're not making use of your histogram, you're not making best use of your photography. Mm. My, my feeling towards that is that I've shot, the, I've shot these cameras enough to know kind of know what's going to work and what's not. Um, the lighting conditions will change rapidly. I don't have, con I don't have control over the lighting conditions. Mm. I don't have control over, I mean, if we're talking acreage, I don't really have control over where I am once I see the light that I want. Sure. Um, so my mindset is almost, I'm either going to get the shot or I'm not. Mm. And, I, and, and I'll use uh, a number of different stops underexposed. And sometimes they don't come out. Um, my reading a histogram at that moment wouldn't make that exposure any different. Mm. Do you have any tips and tricks for people that are starting out with landscape? This is a, a shot right here of uh, Mount Rainier. Our, our mm. next slide right here is a 135 millimeter version of that previous shot. Do you, what kind of tips can you give someone who's just starting out? <clears throat> <laughs> I was just talking to someone about this yesterday. Zero outings results in zero photos. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good so, tip. I like that. Yeah. So get out. Um, if you don't want to dirty up your special camera, then get one that you don't mind dirtying up. Hmm. Um, like your car, they, they will, uh, I mean, you got to maintain them. You got to change oil. They don't last forever. <laughs> yet we don't we don't get too upset about our cars and cars collectors too will have their collectors and then they'll have their daily driver so same thing with a camera have a daily driver that you're not afraid to put some miles on um and and it will reward you um these cameras want to be shot and they're made for shooting and i i, I don't think that i think nothing makes people at like a happier than than a camera that that's been well loved by by putting a lot of frames through it so that's one is to get out and, and shoot your equipment. This is, this is special equipment and um, it, uh, it will produce results that will blow your mind. Um, mm. I've been using M's for a long time now and um, I, I, I still feel like I've just barely scratched the surface. Mm. It's, it's definitely an exploration. I think that um, these cameras push you to be a better photographer because whether it be the more the rangefinder aspect of the camera where you are manually focusing everything, but I think it's also because it has that mechanical feel. And so it, it mm -hmm. kind of just, the, the texture and the feeling of this camera pushes you to kind of not be in this kind of digital mindset. Um, it's a very, mm -hmm. you're seeing something and you wanna capture it and, and feeling that click and hearing those, the movements mm -hmm. of the lens, mm -hmm. it's so satisfying. And I, I, I get excited when I have these cameras and I'm shooting these locations to, to know that I'm going to get something very special, which is something that yeah. I think it's, it's hard to, to replicate. Yeah. Well, I was one of the guys I was with in Moab actually pointed that out. The M was the original point and shoot. Mm. It was the, it was the every man first. And um, it put photography, I mean, generally speaking, it put photography within hands reach of so many people that, that were mystified by it. Um, by today's standards, you know, you have to work for it. <laughs> um, I could talk a lot about automation and, you know, the, the downfall of, 
of, of um, you know, the camera industry with all its, all its wild features that nobody uses. Um, the, the M, you know, you, expects you to, to know what you're doing, at mm -hmm. least with exposure, at least with focus, and at least with framing. Mm. That, that's not too much to ask of a photographer, in my opinion. Um, and secondly, this is the reward. It never argues with you. Mm. It, it doesn't ask you to update software. It'll tell you when the battery's low. Um, <laughs> but even an idiot light, like in the, in the M6, the, the meter, you can still shoot if you're underexposed. Right. It just will remind you that, sure. that you're underexposed or whatever. So um, I've grown to love gear that doesn't argue with me. Um, so the, the M is, is, a real, is a real partner in that, mm. in that aspect. My phone, I never know what to expect. You know, mm. so it, it, you know, the apps move, the apps update, I've got notifications all over the place. It's just, I just <laughs> need a phone, you know? <laughs> the, M, the M is, is, a, is a shooter's camera. And it, it, with some practice and some miles on your M, it's, it's just a joy and it will reward you. Absolutely. Phil, I want to dive deeper into a specific shot. We mentioned this shot a little bit earlier in the program here. Um, this is one of my favorite shots from the series that you're presenting. And the reason why is because we had this shot in very big. I can't remember the exact dimensions at the store, but it was multiple feet. Is that correct? It's 48 inches wide. By 48 30. inches wide. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 34 by 48 with the mat and the frame on there. It's uh you know, it's another eight inches, six, six to eight inches. You, so, men uh, you mentioned about printing and, and how you like to choose your paper and, and kind of uh, explore that aspect of it. Was this something that was a challenge for you for this series? Or did you kind of know um, already what, shot, what paper you wanted to use? Yeah, so uh, the guy I work with for the large prints, I don't have a printer this size. My printer is a Pro 1000 that's a, 21 inch wide print. Mm. I can't do 40 inch prints at home. Um, so I sat down with the guy who I, I do the prints with and uh, we selected two papers. One was a heavy gauge cotton semi textured, slightly warm paper, which is what this is on. Mm. The other was a smooth uh, textureless matte, uh, uh, matte surface, uh, almost completely untoned white. Uh, thinner thinner gauge mm. so if a, if a photo didn't take a texture very well or if it was um, high contrast then we printed it on the on the uh the photo map by moab papers which is the the thinner gauge smooth smooth uh smooth surface mm. the ones that were lighter contrast we printed on the on the warmer uh heavy gauge cotton paper which is what we did this one on nice so, so about half and half Gotcha. One of the things I want to point out is that, so you said 48 inches, right? As far as the final print. And so this is the raw file, what it looked like originally before you edit it. But this is actually a crop from this shot, which blew my mind. 48 inches and you're cropping in into a 24 yep. megapixel file. This is really a, a fantastic example of not only the monochrome camera, but also the glass that is able to resolve these details when you're so cropped in. And then on top of that, make that print even bigger. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, cropping um, is, uh, you know, there are varying perspectives on cropping. My, my perspective on it now is that, is that the resolution is there. Your monitor's not resolving the full resolution of the camera. Um, your small desktop size uh, printers are not resolving. Uh, that I mean, so it's almost like the only way you can enjoy the resolution of your camera is by viewing images at 400% on your monitor. Mm. Um, fun, but not really shareable. <laughs> so uh, I like uh, I like to experiment and and um, you know see what see what see what I can get. Yeah. Um, one of my best buddies and I uh, printed a an image out of the M9 monochrome at nine to 12 megapixels, this mm. size. Wow. So I knew that I knew this one would come out. So this is about 12 to 14 megapixels out of the, the 24 megapixel M246 mm. uh, with the 135 lens. So 
That's the longest M lens. Um, I'm roadside. I'm not climbing mountains on this picture, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, it's really windy. It's really hostile. I can only be out of the car for about five to 10 minutes at a time. Mm. Um, I wished I was closer. So my solution to that was, was cropping. And plus, mm. I'm able to compose the clouds differently. So there are some, there are some photographers, traditionalists, who upon hearing this are going to turn to stone. <laughs> Um, my answer to that is that um, I want to, I'll, I'll leverage whatever tools are available to me as an artist. And mm. I think that's been somewhat the case throughout history. Um, what I will stick to, though, is traditional aspect. So four by six. The ratio. By yeah. Yeah. So those, I'll stick to typical aspect. And I do know that to use anything other than um, recognized aspect ratios, will confuse uh, the viewer. And that's not what I intend, so. And when you're editing a file like this, and especially dealing with snow, what kind of settings do you kind of, do you look for certain things as far as finding a true black, finding a true white, and then finding all the tones between that? Or do you let the scene kind of expose itself in front of you and move that slider along until you feel it's artistically something that you enjoy? Yeah, so something like this is almost an act of desperation. Mm. So. The only, the only traffic on the high, this is Northern Nevada um, near Denio. It's near the border of uh, Oregon and Nevada in the mm. center part of the state. So uh, by act of desperation, what I'm talking about is the sun is just out of the frame in the upper right. Right. We've got, it's almost noon actually. The wor you know, traditionally the worst time to shoot. I'm also on the wrong side of the mountain for a traditional look. Um, and I'm on the shadow side. So the shadows are falling towards me. Right. Um, the light is everywhere. It's too windy for a tripod. Um, I also need a shutter speed that my M won't do. It's too bright. Mm, right. And I want to underexpose. So I committed a, a, a great sin <laughs> by stacking a dark red 29 with a polarizer on the 135. Ooh, okay. To get the fast or to get the shutter speed low enough that my camera would do so that I could get an underexposure mm. of the scene. That all right. sounds messed up, you know? Right. But, um, and, and add to that, I'm dodging um, snow plows. Yes, indeed, and wind. So, yeah, and the, the <laughs> snow plows are out to clear the roads for emergency vehicles. Not There's no, there's no commuters or <laughs> vacationers on the road. So I see it as a challenge, um, mm. a fun challenge, a rule-breaking challenge. Um, yes. Yeah, a rebellious nature in photography, but I spent a lot of money on the gear. I want to get the shots. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And so that's kind of, um, it's a comedy of experimentation, I guess. Mm. And it, it reflects uh, not only my goal to, you know, capture ideal states of meditation, of moment, of sense of presence, but it's also of addressing challenge and just feeling excited about taking pictures. Mm. So that sounds naive, it sounds juvenile, but it, um, it's, it's taught me to laugh, it's taught me to have fun while undertaking you know, a very serious subject, which is the exploration of self and, and expression of, of life at its most serious moments. Mm. Let's, let's talk more about the gear that you're using. Um, I'm going to switch gears and we're going to talk more about your recent work. And recently you have purchased a Leica S system and shooting now in medium format. Can you tell me a little bit more about what differences you are experiencing with this new system versus shooting with a full frame monochrome camera? Right. So uh, 2020 is a year of change for a lot of people for a lot of different, on a lot of different levels. Mm. Um, and the M world, the, the 40 megapixel era is here. Indeed. So in the past we'd think, all right, well, 24 megapixels is out of date or no longer any good. Um, in the past, I just would have upgraded the M's right away. Mm. Um, but uh, taking what I just spoke about with uh, resolution, the only way to really enjoy it is with a giant print that nobody has a printer for. Mm. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know. And plus you've got smaller pixels. So there's a different digital workflow. Right. Um, 
there has always been medium format in the background that I haven't been able to answer uh, the questions for myself. Um, you know, is the glass all that better? Um, what does larger pixels mean really? Mm. Um, so uh, a lot of people unloaded their uh, medium format equipment uh, in the springtime of 2020 and I was able to pick up a kit, you know, relatively inexpensively because I wanted, before I upgraded to a 40 megapixel uh, M, I love the new M's by the way, um, they're, they're amazing. The noise control is better. The resolution allows all kinds of cropping, you know, options. Um, there's really nothing not to like if you're an M person. But I, I didn't want to change my 24 megapixel workflow without answering the question of uh, what is the truth about pixel size and pixel pitch? What I'm getting out of the S so far is uh, better transitions, less occurrences of halo, better edge definition, um, the, all the lenses are super high quality, like the APO 50 and the M. Um, the viewfinder has opened an entirely different world, uh, to me, those not familiar with the S it has a, a massive viewfinder. My eyesight is actually very poor. Um, what I've done with the M is I can focus, you know, the, by squinting, I can focus the, the focus patch in the, uh, in the viewfinder and I have to approximate the frame unless it's the 135, which is really small in the viewfinder. Um, and I use other, like a point and shoot to help spot um, mm. or my phone. With the S, um, I'm actually able to work entirely through the viewfinder for the first time in my life with any camera really? system. Yes. Interesting, okay. Um, I didn't expect that. I knew the viewfinder was good, but I, I quickly figured out this is a major asset. Mm. I can, um, the, the camera is really large. It's no bigger than any other medium format camera, except some of the mirrorless ones, which in my opinion, you give up some image quality uh, for. Mm. But it, it's no bigger than a, a traditional, you know, Nikon, you know, uh, SLR system. But with the, with the viewfinder, it was the first time on this trip, it was the first time I actually didn't want to put the S down. Um, mm. When I first started shooting it, when I was done with it, I was ready to put it away. <laughs> you know, it's big. It's not a, it's not the romantic experience that the M is to shoot. Um, and I do know that if you don't like the equipment you're shooting, you're not going to take good pictures with it, or not as good of pictures as you're going to take with a camera that you really love to carry and that you really love to shoot. Mm. Um, it was with the viewfinder that I turned a corner with the S on this trip. I, I actually want to spot with it. I actually want to shoot it and I want to set it up and um, I don't mind carrying it anymore with you know it's a it's a real load in the field with a couple lenses mm -hmm. um, uh, you know for what four times the weight and three times the size as, as an M system maybe even more mm. um, but the the real answer is going to come in the in the coming months after I am done with this trip yeah and I get through all the photos because the real question that would drove this is pixel size Mm. What does that mean? And what am I going to get out of it? Um, there's also, there's one liability that I want to be aware of, and that's, am I going to give up that, that magic that the M lenses deliver? Mm. So if I'm adding to what I got out of the M, great. If I'm taking away from what I got out of the M, not so great. Mm. The photo that you have up here, I can tell you that if I processed it, if I shot this uh, and processed, processed it under my current workflow out of the M, I wouldn't have gotten out of the sky what I got here. I would have mm. had a badly haloed uh, sky. I wouldn't have been able to mask that rock, which is this is Liberty Liberty Bell Mountain in the North Cascades near home. So I do know for certain that I wouldn't have been able to get the dramatic sky that I got yeah. with and the you, S in this shot. You can clearly see the difference in contrast and how well this lens and system is able to capture the difference in like that the sharp aspect of the rocks in the mountains mm. and that silky sky. And that transition mm -hmm. is just, it's that 3D look that people talk about. It's, it's very pronounced in, in this shot right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Phil, yeah, we have this some... Was, this was also at the worst time of day to shoot. This is sure. about one o'clock in the afternoon. We, uh, we have some questions from the chat. And uh, one of the questions that uh, come up is, uh, what do you focus on? When you're doing landscape, how do you choose what to focus on and how do you choose your subject matter? Okay. So um, let me choose subject matter first. 
I shoot what's interesting to me. Mm. And I think that's a really simple formula. I don't think any of us have gone to a national park and struggled to find something interesting. <laughs> um, shoot what, what you're drawn to. Mm. Um, what you like is what's gonna look the best out of your photos. That sounds really elementary, but it doesn't need to be really difficult. Um, if you're shooting whatever, then it doesn't matter. Um, if you're doing portraiture professionally, you're doing commercial product photography, totally different matter, totally different. I mean, it's really important to get the spec right. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, but when you're, when you're expressing yourself, it's kind of like writing in a diary. How do you do it wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, yes, there are some specifics you should know, exposure, and then there are some you know, uh, uh, principles of composition, which will strengthen your work. So hopefully that answers the question about subject. And um, what do you choose to focus on when you have so many things to focus on? Right. So focus. Um, I just spent some time in Yosemite with a, with a very seasoned uh, four by five shooter mm. who also had experiment, experience with the S and I um, was able to get some really good input from him. Got a brush up education on Ansel Adams and F64 concept. Uh, everything in focus. So with the S, I've actually been stacking focus because mm. the, the depth of field is is um, not as deep as it is with 35 millimeter format. Right. With 35 millimeter format, you can stop all the way down F22 or F16 and get away with it um, mm. with everything being in focus. Uh, not so much with medium format. So I've actually been stacking focus and um, shooting four frames per scene. Uh, sometimes I'll, so far I've seen that maybe one of those frames with some something out of focus, something in focus. Usually there's a central point of interest. I wanna make sure that's in focus. Mm. Uh, with a, with a ultra wide or a wide, like a 28 or the 35 in, the, in S terms. Mm. Um, even when you're stopped down, if you've got something in your, your point of interest is 50 yards away, your foreground's not gonna be in focus. Right. And so I, I'm mean, talking foreground at your feet. Um, so, uh, stacking is kind of, kind of important. So I guess the, the, the question is, what's your depth of field? What, what, what depth of field do you want? You want to emphasize your point of interest or do you want to go traditional black and white, you know, F64 and have everything in focus? Um, you can never go wrong with everything in focus. I think, uh, for your viewer, more is always better when it comes to things to look at. Um, <laughs> isolated, isolated subjects in focus are fascinating, beautiful but there's not as much to look at. Mm. So um, those are the things I would consider. We have uh, time for only one last question. And I think it's a, it's a really uh, interesting and important question. As someone who has been photographing in pretty much the same area, Pacific Northwest, Midwest, for a certain amount of time now, you have the ability to see how landscape changes throughout the seasons, throughout the years. Can you talk more about that? How you, when you come back to a certain place, you might be surprised that it's different. And uh, how do you choose to photograph that change as it's presented in front of you? Yeah, yeah. So can you back up to the, uh, the scenes of the snow squalls? Yep. Let's see here. On the first slides. Uh, keep, uh, keep going. Uh, the snow squalls at Lake Gabert. I can't. I can't remember where they were in the sequence. Here. Um, <clears throat> that's all right. So, to answer the question, one of the uh, one of the locations of the pictures in, in the series that we that we're looking at today, I was actually out shooting for the first time in four years just yesterday, mm. and it looked totally different. Um, I'm shooting at roughly the same time of year. The big difference was it was snowing when I was here four years ago and it wasn't yesterday. It was strangely calm, no wind, really rare for this part of Eastern Oregon. The sun was out with patchy clouds, you know, like the cow spot, cow, the, like the, the dairy cow spots, those kind of clouds um, looked like a different planet. Mm -hmm. There's also, environments also change as I have through the years. Um, mm. You know, one good example is, well, I went back to such and such, and it looks smaller. <laughs> you know, that's a that's a comical <laughs> example. Um, 
but this actually happened like Abert that I was at um, yesterday it actually looks smaller mm. um, it, there hasn't been as much precipitation so the lake is actually lower but my point is uh, even home will look different over the years um, we don't have a lot of deciduous trees in the northwest so we don't get a lot of color change there can be um, some in some areas for fall um, but uh, the, the one scene for the, the cover photo for um, Lake Academy that's coming up, uh, Columbia Gorge, mm -hmm. uh, recently I shot that in summer because it looks right. very different. You get the dappled sunlight in the foreground, the sunlight through the trees kind of thing. Um, but uh, I guess to answer the question, the biggest, the, biggest is, the biggest thing for me is that even places of familiarity change as I do through time. Mm. Wonderful answer. Well, folks, this is unfortunately the time that we have for today. Phil, I want to thank you for joining us. This was so fun. Uh, there are ways for us to keep in touch through Instagram. This is Philip Lair's Instagram page. Please feel free to, uh, to uh, follow him and to ask him questions through, through Instagram. Phil also has a website. We'll be putting the links on the chat as well philipblairs.com where we can see all the pictures that we talked about today as well as some other programs and projects that Phil is working on including a book that's coming out a little bit later in the year. And we finally have Phil your workshop coming up in February 2021. We had to do a second workshop because the first one sold out. So congratulations on that. And uh, I'm very excited for all the attendees that are going to be joining you um, in a couple months now. Thank you. Absolutely. If you want to know more about these kinds of programs, please follow us at Like a Camera USA on Instagram and Like a Academy USA on Instagram as well. Again, Phil, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Nathan. We'll see you later. Absolutely.